Hello, everyone, and welcome to the weekly Mind and Bleep webinars. Uh, today, we're going to um, be joined by Dr. Annabel Brown, who's going to deliver a session on what to do when you have to assess someone who has fallen during your, your on-call shift. Um, as always, please uh, feel free to post any questions you might have in the comments section. We will reply to them during the session or at the end. Um, so if there's anything pressing, please feel free to ask. Also, if you'd like to send us any questions after the webinar, please feel free to do so. Um, and then we're going to have a Q&A section afterwards. Um, all of the sessions are recorded and you will send, we'll send you the link for the session today. Um, if you register at mindthebleep.com, I'm going to post the link in the comment section um, so you can sign up later on. And before we start, just a quick shout out to our sponsors, the MDU. Please don't forget to sort out your MDU Foundation membership before you start your shadowing. Um, unless you fill the foundation application form, the membership you had when you were a student will cease in the summer. So it's essential they do have um, an appropriate indemnity to cover. So please, uh, please check if you have signed up and I'm going to include the link in the comment section as well. So for now, I'm just going to hand over to Dr. Annabelle, who's going to talk to you about falls. Thank you, Sarah. So thank you everyone to who's joining us today. This is our webinar on assessing falls. So it's a common anxiety among new doctors and it's a source of much uncertainty. This webinar is aimed at uh, soon to be F1 doctors, first responders, nurses and other healthcare professionals. If there are any occupational therapists or physiotherapists um, tuning in, please say hi um, in the chat. There will be an opportunity to share your vast knowledge during the questions at the end. Um, so let's get started. So to introduce myself, my name is Annabelle. I'm a foundation year one doctor working in a hospital in Northwest London in the UK. And as one of the junior members of the team, assessing falls on call and on the take, which is where people are coming into A&E for the first time, um, is something I do very frequently. So hopefully we can get a little bit of a handle on that knowledge today. So today we'll be covering introduction to falls and common causes. You've been bleeped and what to do when on call and some helpful hints and tips. Assessing someone who's had a fall, investigations and a summary at the end. So why is this topic important? Well, firstly, it's common. As a junior doctor, you often assess patients who have fallen both on the call and on take. Falls are the most frequent cause of unintentional injuries in elderly people, and that it's life-threatening as well. So causes of falls vary from the innocuous to the life-threatening and always need assessment. So when you're on call, even if it's busy, you always need to assess someone that's had a fall on the ward. Um, but it can be helpful for your nursing colleagues if you say when you're going to be there, if you're particularly busy. Um, and thirdly, there's a variety of causes. It requires a bit of practice to assess why someone has fallen. So hopefully with this introduction today, you can get, get to know what kind of things you're looking for. So essentially any pathology in every system in the body can cause a fall. So a detailed history is essential in determining the cause of falls. You want to be relying on collateral history from your nursing colleagues, healthcare assistants, and anyone else who is there on the ward when someone has fallen. But also you want to be speaking to the patient themselves and their family members or next of kin if they were there for the fall. So you need to be systematic when approaching a fall. Starting with the cardiovascular causes, Heart rhythm problems can often cause falls and it's quite difficult to get an idea of why this has happened and often this will require a 24 hour trace after the fact. So arrhythmias, bradycardia and also valvular heart disease are all common causes of falls but orthostatic hypertension is a very common one in that when someone stands up their blood pressure drop causes them to have a vasovagal event and fall over. Um, so that's the cardiovascular causes. Infective causes can vary, but the two most common are a community acquired pneumonia or CAP and a urinary tract infection or UTI. 
And these can often be seen on either x-ray for a cap, chest x-ray, um, or a UTI via urine dip and urine MCNS. So neurological causes. Stroke is a common and serious cause of fall and needs prompt assessment if you suspect a stroke. Peripheral neuropathy is slightly less um, serious, but it can also be a cause of a fall. If people have, if patients have less of less feedback coming back at them, for instance, from their feet, not quite sure where the ground is, not quite sure where their slippers are or anything like that, it can make it more likely that they will fall. Metabolic reasons include hypoglycemia and also alcohol excess, often forgotten in the elderly community um, because of assumptions that people make about lifestyles of patients, but always important to ask. And we ask everyone who comes into hospital how much alcohol they drink on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Musculoskeletal causes include arthritis, both in the small joints and in the large joints, such as the shoulders, hips and knees. Disuse atrophy as well is where the muscles become wasted away after not being used, a common problem in elderly patients, especially those who are not active. And in a similar vein, deconditioning as well. If someone has just come out of a long stay in hospital and they haven't been working with the physiotherapist and occupational therapist before they leave, it can mean that they are deconditioned to being at home. And it can often be a cause of fall. Finally, ear, nose and throat conditions such as vertigo and even earwax. So the last section in the causes of falls is practical issues. Now, your occupational therapist colleagues are the experts on this, but things like inadequate mobility aids, like if they need a frame, do they use their frame? Do they need a stick? Do they need a rail? And are they actually using them? That can all be all contribute to someone falling over when at home, especially if they're particularly if the rail or the mobility aid is out of reach and they're not familiar with using them or they're nervous about using them. So a lot of patients find that when they go home, whether due to cognitive impairment or due to deconditioning, they are not using the same mobility aids that they got used to while in hospital. Other practical issues that can cause falls are polypharmacy. So this um, definition varies slightly, but it's for patients who've got more than, uh, more than three drugs that they're taking, um, and they can interact um, in unusual ways and cause falls. And visual impairment is a common one, and also dehydration, both a cause and consequence of falls, as well as things like slippers and inappropriate footwear. So on-call tips. Let's say that someone has bleeped you about a fall on the ward. What do you need to do? Well, you need to put these ideas about causes for falls into practice. It's really helpful to gather information over the phone first. Often it's one of your nursing colleagues calling about a fall on the ward. And essential information includes their, the patient's observations. Are they on the floor, but they're quite comfortable? They have a news of zero. They have no shortness of breath, no raised heart rate or anything like that. Or are they quite sick and they've fallen while they were quite sick as well? So recent observations are really important. Another key question is, are they on anticoagulation? This makes a big difference because if someone is on anticoagulation and falls and hit their head, they should get a CT head as part of the NICE criteria for a CT head. But we will get onto that a bit more later. There's also, especially on a busy on-call shift, it can be really helpful to make any initial requests when you first get the call, the call. such as an ECG and also getting any initial um, Obs initial observations and initial investigations. The A to E approach that you may be familiar with is much better done in person, but you can get a bit of an idea of it of asking um, your nursing colleague or whoever's making the call a couple of basic questions, but overall needs to be done in person. As always, it's nicer to give a time frame as well. So if you say, okay, please could you get that ECG for me? I'll be there in 20 minutes. So, your nursing colleague gives you a handover in SBAR format. Let's begin. So a 75 year old gentleman has had a fall on the ward and you've been bleeped about it by one of your nursing colleagues. The story is the gentleman in bed three had an unwitnessed fall and fell forwards. 
no seizure. Background is he's had a previous hip replacement surgery in 2005. He also has hypertension or high blood pressure, diabetes and hypercholesterolemia or high cholesterol. The assessment over the phone from your nursing colleague is he's got a news of one, pulse is 95, but he's now back in bed and he's got a painful knee. The recommendation from your nursing colleague is please come and see him. So a few things may be going through your mind and a good thing to bear in mind is just a quick set of questions. Thankfully, this with this handover, you've got a lot of information just from the SBAR. But for instance, what I might add to this is say is ask, is your any anticoagulation and please could you get an ECG? Then on your way there, and, and also when you're going to be there. So let's say you're going to be there in 10 minutes. On your way there, you want to be thinking about what kind of questions you're going to be asking. And a really helpful way to structure this is before, during and after. And especially on a night shift, on a busy on-call shift, simple things like before, during, after is much easier to remember than a complicated list. So before the fall, when you get there, you want to ask the patient, or if it was a witnessed fall and the patient has cognitive difficulties and therefore can't answer the collateral history, you want to ask, did you get any feeling of your heart pounding in your chest, any palpitations? Were you short of breath? Did you have any chest pain or pain anywhere in your body, such as in the shoulders or back before you fell? Did you have an aura? So often people won't know what an aura is, but you can ask, are there any visual changes? Did you have any funny smells or anything like that before you fell down? Any dizziness, any weakness or any loss of consciousness? A telltale sign is if a patient falls over and they don't remember hitting the floor, that can often be a sign that they lost consciousness before they fell. So for someone who was conscious and is not cognitively impaired, they will be able to describe that they saw the floor coming towards them or they felt themselves falling or something like that. But if you don't get that from the history, then consider that they've had a loss of consciousness. During, again, maybe they fell and then they don't remember what happened. Was there any loss of consciousness? Did you hit your head? Did you have any instance of shaking of your arms and legs and a feeling of a seizure? Any tongue biting, that can also be a sign of a seizure and can point you towards a more neurological cause. And finally, afterwards, how long were you on the floor for? How did the help come? Did you call out for a nurse? Did they spot you? Did, any, um, did another patient in the bay notice or something like that? And then how are they now? Are they drowsy? Do they feel weak? Are they post-ictal? So often after a seizure, patients can be quite... Um, confused and not really not really feeling themselves they're a bit slow to answer questions they're a bit out of sorts and especially for patients with known epilepsy they feel that it's a familiar feeling um, after a seizure and we call it post-ictal so you've asked these questions to either your um, nursing colleague or HCA or whoever is there to get a collateral history and you've talked to the patient themselves now you want to gather the background you need to approach the notes and approach the drug chart to get some background onto why the patient is in hospital. You want their reason for admission and how long they've been in hospital. Their past medical history and do they have any postural hypertension, a sudden drop in BP when they stand up, any previous stroke, any known arrhythmias, any diabetes for that peripheral neuropathy we were talking about earlier, or even a hypoglycemic episode. You need to look at their drug chart or drug card any antihypertensives, any opioids, any hypoglycemic agents, which can cause a hypo and a fall, and any sedatives. Once you've gathered that information, you have a lot more information before you examine your patient. So this is when the examination comes. You need a full A to E and top to toe examination. Again, as we said earlier, on a busy on-call shift, it's difficult to remember complicated things. So stuff like A to E and top to toe is just a simple way of approaching a patient, but making sure you get all those key areas. So you want to go absolutely top to toe and A to E. You want to inspect and palpate for any cuts, bruises or injuries. Absolutely essential is make sure you palpate and ask about any injuries on the head hips and femurs, but all the bony prominences as you go down the body are essential to check over. 
The reason why this is, is because something like a fractured neck of femur or a fracture in the knee or the elbow or anything like that is often a, um, a consequence of falling. But if missed, that can be really painful and really unfortunate for the patient because the outcomes are much worse if you miss these things. So you also want to clearly document their GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale um, as rated by eyes, voice and best motor response and their neuro examination findings. It's always useful to do a quick neuro examination such as power, tone, coordination, reflexes and sensation in the upper and lower limb um, for completeness but also for your own peace of mind that you haven't missed anything. Then things like th other things that are by the bedside, such as their catheter, any bruises, any, any pain anywhere, and anything that may have contributed to the fall. Is there a wet floor next to them? Is there, um, are there ECG leads tangled around their feet or anything like that? Finally, you want to review their observations and get a lying and standing blood pressure. So that's on the ward. What if you're on the take? which is when people come in the front door through A&E and you need to clerk someone in or take their history. So this case is slightly different. So this gentleman is 81 and he's been admitted from home with a fall. The presenting complaint is that he's had low eating and drinking the last few days and he fell after tripping on a pile of clothes in his house. So the background is he's got high blood pressure, hypercholesterolemia, depression, vascular dementia, and lives alone, no carers. Um, his wife sadly passed away last year, who used to care for him. And a, the ambulance crew has pro kindly provided a clutter scale. So the clutter scale can vary from one to nine based on how much clutter is in someone's house. Um, and so in this gentleman, um, it's a five. His medications are amlodipine, citalopram, atorvastatin and senna for constipation. So your plan will then depend on your assessment. So you've done your full history like we've talked through. You've done the observations and you've done some basic um, first tests like an ECG. What's next in your plan? So either on the ward or on the take, it will really depend on that first assessment. Where are the injuries? What sounds suspicious in the history? What kind of thing are you thinking about? Once you've got the ECG, bloods are really helpful. And um, for a deeper dive into that topic and what bloods to order when, uh, we've got a seminar from last week about ordering bloods and analysing them. Um, but for our purposes today, you'll want a basic set of, of, of um, routine bloods with a bone profile will be helpful. And then anything else you might need based on their presentation. Neurological observations, if there's any head injury and x-ray of any injuries. So injured bones and joints are really crucial here. And that's where you'll be getting your x-rays. Finally, there's a lot of discussion about whether you need a CT head. If there's significant injury, such as they had a strike of their head against the floor or a table or anything like that, if the patient is on anticoagulation, they're more at risk of an intracranial bleed. And if there's abnormal neurology, all of these are criteria that are part of the NICE guidance of when to do a CT head. And I really recommend looking through that guideline when you have a chance, because it's a really helpful piece of um, advice. So we've mentioned this a bit already, common order set post fall, we're looking for your routine bloods, which is full blood count using these CRP LFT. Also bone profile is very helpful, especially in elderly people, thyroid, vitamin D and hematinics, which is B12 and folate. So the plan continued. Do you have an idea of the underlying cause? Can you optimize the drug chart? For instance, did they have their hypoglycemic this morning? It caused them to have a hypo. And because of the interactions from the new antibiotic you've started them on, it's been more potent than it would be otherwise. And it caused them to have a hypo and fall. Could you change around those drugs to make sure? Does this patient need one-to-one -one nursing? Have they had more than one fall? Do you think they're at risk of another one? Do you need to hold the anticoagulation while you wait for a CT head? 
And do you need to speak to one of your seniors, either an SHO or a registrar? Um, and depending on the time of day, even your consultant. These will all depend on your assessment. And it always comes back to your history, examination and your investigations. So in summary, we've talked through a few things today. We've talked about how falls are common, but they can have many varied causes. We always want to use an A to E approach and top to toe, and also make sure that your collateral history is good. Your collateral history may be coming from your ambulance, your ambulance sheet, which is provided by your paramedic colleagues. It may be from a nurse or HCA or PT or OT or even another patient on the ward, but it can also be from the patient's home environment. Is it from their neighbour? Is it from their next of kin? Is it from one of their carers? Is it from their nursing home? All of these require a bit of detective work and a bit of digging. And ideally, with enough time, you can get to the bottom of any collateral history. Of course, when people have unwitnessed falls, it's much more difficult to get this. But a collateral history can still be helpful when, for instance, if you have someone at home who had an unwitnessed fall, but their carers are often noticing that they are almost falling or having a lot of near misses, that can be really helpful as well. You always need to be thorough in these patients because a fall somewhere along their stay or as the reason that they come into hospital can be a real game changer in how you treat them and how you get them better. If you're thinking about a cardiac cause, things like a 24 hour tape and an echocardiogram, which is the ultrasound of the heart, can be really helpful to see whether the cardiac cause could be um, helped in some way and to see what's the exact reason why they may have fallen. There's always a risk with the 24 hour tape that you won't actually see an arrhythmia um, because the arrhythmia happened during the fall, but it's really helpful just to see whether that arrhythmia can come back or anything like that. So in summary, falls are common, but can have many varied causes. Always use an A to E approach and the collateral history can be invaluable. We're here to answer any questions and we're joined by our other colleague, um, Dr. Anna, who's here as well. And we can answer any questions that you put in the chat. And then there's just a couple more things from us before we finish. Hi, Annabelle, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, great talk, learned a lot. We haven't actually got any questions at the moment. So if anybody does have any questions on the talk, please do um, write them in the chat and we can answer them as best we can. I know falls was something that I used to find, mm. find very tricky when I was first called as an F1. They used to really scare me, if I'm honest. There's just so many different things that can cause a person to have a fall mm. and stuff that you wouldn't consider. Mm -hmm. um, I know I had a lady once who um, she had very focal glasses. Oh, yeah. And just when she moved too quickly, mm. it like altered her eyesight. And that had caused her to fall over and end up in hospital. And it was something as simple as just uh, have changing our glasses and having to um, just go with one one prescription for our glasses stopped her from falling. Yeah, you know, I find it's so that. often just the little things. I think the number as well of people that I've seen where it's because of their earwax and their underlying vertigo and, you know, heart is fine, oh, wow. lungs are fine, <laughs> no big... Yeah, no big um, pathologies, but it's the little things as well as the practical things, exactly as you're saying, that can really mm -hmm. make a difference in actually making them better by the time they go home. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Would you have any more um, tips yeah. to add for what, when you're on call and you get a call about um, call about a fall on the ward? Um, I, at the trust I'm currently working at, mm. we have a um, falls protocol which is a booklet, mm. which I only found out about quite recently. And um, prior, like prior to using this booklet, I would do, like you said, try and go through everything. But there is quite a lot to remember. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you would, I would get to the end and think, oh God, I forgot to ask this question. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the um, booklet, you can fill the booklet out and it takes you through step by step to make sure you've answered mm -hmm. all the questions. And they're quite um, easy to fill out. So with regards like aura, it says like, did your patient have an aura? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. So then you definitely know if you've asked it and got a response for it. So I would highly recommend everybody uses that. 
Yeah, that would possible. also make a great audit project as well, I bet for Definitely. people uh -huh. joining f1 who if their hospital doesn't have that kind of pro forma we have does your one have a a set of like next steps like investigations and a plan mm -hmm. or is it more like the assessment portion it's more of the assessment but it does have a bit on the bottom which i always find helpful and it says if in any doubt contact the med reg Mm -hmm. just to run by the patient's fall and i think a lot of my colleagues have used it just to give them a ring, discuss what happens, and then get some senior advice rather than sitting worrying about it and leaving yeah. the agent. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. We the, do um, have one question, had a question on, the, from, on the chat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we've had a question from Linda. She just said, if patients are on VTE prophylaxis, should they still be scanned for a head injury? Oh, really good question. So if in... So I'd be interested to hear what you think about this as well, Anna. But in our hospital, if they haven't had, if they're not on a DOAC or warfarin, the low molecular weight heparin at the small dose that we give as prophylaxis doesn't necessarily qualify as anticoagulation. However, if they've got a, a, a head injury that is significant, it's likely that a CT head would be warranted. Or if it's got another, if they have another one of those um, criteria like ongoing neurology, um, then that would definitely warrant a CT head. But just the fact of being on low molecular weight heparin in our hospital tends to not be a criteria. Um, would would you say the same Anna, at your hospital, or is it or is it different? Yeah. No, I completely agree. Exactly the same. But I think we've just got a very low um, suspicion, like suspicion level. So if you're worried by any means at all, mm -hmm. normally get a CT scan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, it was, and it's always, always better to be safe than sorry, really. Isn't Definitely. It? Yeah. There's even, we've, we were talking um, the other day about a case where we had someone who had a fall on the ward. Um, and unfortunately, it did lead to a bleed later on in their stay um, and they dropped their GCS, but it was only about four days afterwards. And it was discussed at a morbidity and mortality meeting. And we were looking through the notes and the documentation of when the lady had fallen. Um, it was all a bit scattered and it wasn't clear whether she'd hit her head or not. Um, because one of the nurses had written that the HCA thought she said that thought that she hit her head but wasn't mm -hmm. sure and then in the next set of assessments and when the performer was filled out when the on-call team it um, it all said about not hitting her head um, and so I think it really that case really taught me about um, the importance of good documentation and really getting a good collateral because in that case that um, affected my colleagues we realized that it was only the small things like writing about what they actually saw and what they thought happened was a real um, game changer in like the next steps yeah definitely one and um, funny it's not it's not funny by any means but it did make me laugh at the time was a lady I've had a few ladies who've tripped over their dogs. Do you know oh. people who've had little small sausage oh, dogs? Bless them. They've just got under the got, got under the feet and then had well, luckily none of them been seriously injured by any means. <laughs> oh bless them. Um, I should have had that on the slide as practical steps. Like sausage dogs. <laughs> oh bless. <laughs> them. Hopefully the um, quality of life benefit though of having a little sausage dog definitely outweighs yeah. that. Very true. Lovely. The, um, if I we don't have any more we, yeah, questions, yeah, we could move on to our the last bits from us. Amazing. Um, so we're going to post a QR code on the slide and I'm going to post the feedback form in the comments section. Um, please, everyone who has attended, fill in the feedback form and be as detailed and specific as possible. Um, because this does help Annabelle and it does help the Mind the Bleak platform to develop future sessions. Um, and it's helpful for us to know what to improve. Um, so if you have a few minutes spare, please fill in the feedback form. Um, and if there are no questions at the moment and you think of the questions in the future, please just send us a message on Facebook or via Mind the Bleak. 
um, on the website. Um, and thank you very much, um, Annabelle. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. And thank you so um, much, Anna. just a quick reminder for everyone to join us for the next session next week. It's on Wednesday, uh, it's eight to nine again, and it's going to be a session on complaints um, delivered by Lausanne from the MDU. So I hope everyone will join us and please remember to sign up and register for the Mind the Bleep um, website and webinars. And I hope to see everyone here next week. Thank you. Oh, and as well, you can get a certificate for attending the webinar. Um, if you fill in the feedback form afterwards, you can get a certificate that you've attended um, and you can pop that in your portfolio as well. Um, and it can count as non-core teaching for your portfolio when you start F1 and it's good for ARCP and things like that. And exactly as Sarah said, it really helps us and we want to improve and we need it for our portfolios too. So that would be really great if people could fill in the feedback. Otherwise, yeah, we'll see you um, next week for MDU and dealing with complaints. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.